Good morning, San Antonio starts right now. And good morning to you. It is Thursday, it's July 2nd. We have some breaking news in the Jeffrey Epstein scandal. Just in the last few moments, we have learned that the longtime girlfriend of Jeffrey Epstein, Ghislaine Maxwell, has been arrested in connection with those sex crimes that Epstein was accused of. She was arrested in New Hampshire today. That's right. According to the FBI, still a developing story. We'll have more on that coming up throughout the day on KSAT.com and, of course, on the news at noon. We want to turn now to a story that is certainly uh, jaw-dropping related to the coronavirus pandemic. Of course, we've been told over and over again not to gather with friends or family, not to be in large groups. Well, apparently in Alabama, young people are throwing coronavirus parties where there is a payout if you actually get COVID-19. If you're shaking your head right now, you're not alone. These parties are being held in Tuscaloosa and infected people are urged to attend so others can intentionally contract the virus. Unbelievable. Of course, city officials, they're frustrated by this. They're doing everything they can to put a stop to it. Apparently, uh, these parties are happening all over Tuscaloosa. There are ticket sales. That's how money is made uh, for the person who actually ends up getting coronavirus, they, uh, you know, they get the, the pot of money if they're the ones who come out sick after these parties. At first, city and county officials thought it was a rumor there in Tuscaloosa, but then it turns out with the help of doctors, they confirmed it was happening. One city official said it makes me furious, furious to the fact that someone is so serious and deadly, uh, something that is so serious and deadly is being taken for granted. Not only is it irresponsible, but you could contract the virus and take it home to your parents or grandparents. Unbelievable. City is working to get out word, by the way, to break up the parties. They have also passed a mask ordinance this week there in Tuscaloosa, Alabama, and that goes into effect on Monday. Who would have imagined? Let's take a look at your morning rundown. For the first time, we've seen more than 50,000 new cases in a single day, and the number of people in the hospital is back to the level we saw in May. <laughs> Temperature checks were originally required for both employees and customers, but now Mayor Ron Nirenberg has amended that, saying that businesses will be required to post a list of COVID-19 symptoms. Russian President Vladimir Putin has tightened his grip on power. Voters have passed a referendum that allows Putin to stay in office until 2036. The opposition accuses the government of rigging the vote. Biden's camp says it raised $141 million last month. President Trump's campaign brought in $131 million. The family of Fort Hood soldier Vanessa Guillen now fighting for new legislation in hopes of preventing harassment in the U.S. military. Our family is pushing for legislation that would create a separate agency. 23 years after his wrongful conviction, Jonathan Irons is a free man. WNBA star Maya Moore giving up her 2019 season to help Irons overturn his conviction on charges of burglary and assault. The U.S. Department of the Interior is unveiling its plans for its July 4th Salute to America celebration. The Blue Angels and others will be back for a second year. The NFL preseason will be shorter due to the coronavirus. The league will play two preseason games instead of four. Supply from China dropped earlier this year, but the interest for leisure biking increased during the pandemic. Bike shop owners in San Antonio report a huge increase in sales since March. Some high tech help to keep beachgoers aware of sharks lurking nearby. It's called the Shark Activity app. It can track shark sightings as well as the movement of sharks that researchers have tagged with sensors. Oh, so it's like ways for great whites. <laughs> I got yes. it. Yeah. Hopefully I never have to use that. Me too. Let's go. I thought it was so interesting that bike sales went up during this pandemic. Oh, I'm not surprised. You know? Bike sales, kayak sales, fishing tackle, all that kind well, of stuff. Well, remember early on when puzzles were sold out? You could not find a puzzle on. We're all trying to find things to do, right? And hopefully this weekend, getting out, enjoying the outdoors would be a good way to find something to do. Socially distanced. Speaking of outside, let's go out there with live cam. Bring in Justin Horn, talk more about what's been a pretty a monotonous forecast this week overall. It has, and by the way, guys, I'm breaking out the slip and slide this weekend, so that's, that's gonna happen. <laughs> I've been begging for that one. Is that for you or the kids? 
the kids, I might try it out. Okay. Oh, you got to. Dads always have to try out this. Yeah, until fun. you get injured, you slide right off the end into a tree. <laughs> it can happen. Uh, let's take a look at the temperatures right now. 81 degrees at the airport, 75 Rock Springs, 80 Uvalde, 82 right now in Carrizo Springs. It's a warm start. We're going to have some hazy conditions today. That dust tries to work back in and look at these high temperatures next few days. We're talking 98, 99. We could be up near 100 this weekend. It's entirely possible. It will be very warm. We have been tracking a couple showers this morning out west. In fact, some very heavy rain a little bit earlier around Del Rio. Some estimates, five to six inches out there in Valverde County is one of those complexes just sort of sat there. But most of that has died down now. We've just got some leftover cloud cover. Hey, we got to pass this along. Today is a CPS peak use, CPS energy peak usage day. You got to lower your energy use from 3 p uh, 3 p.m. to 6 p.m. Uh, these hot temperatures uh, causing some of that to go on. So just a heads up there. Uh, forecast heat index this afternoon up around 101. So you can see why uh, the forecast heat index at Del Rio 104. It is uh, another toasty day. Air temperatures should be up around 98 this afternoon and it will be a little bit hazy guys. All right, thank you, Justin. Let's take a look at traffic out there. US 90 at Couples, no problem. Same situation, 1604 in Hausman, and uh, the fly over there, 281 to 410. All things looking good on the roads. Top stories we are following today. We're still waiting to learn the name of the man killed Wednesday night during a shooting on the south side. San Antonio police tell us uh, the another victim remains in critical condition this morning. It happened just after six last night in the 900 block of Ripford. Officers found two victims in their 40s. Police say one of them was a man who was walking in the area and was hit by a stray bullet in the stomach. The other was shot in the chest and was pronounced dead at the scene. Investigators believe the shooting was the result of an argument over money. Right now, police are still looking for at least one suspect in this case. Up to $11,000. That's how much money Crime Stoppers is now offering for information that leads to arrest the killer of an 18-year-old San Antonio man. The Lone Star Fugitive Task Force made an arrest in this case last December, but police believe there are still more people involved in this murder. George Ramos was an up-and-coming boxer who had just gone pro. Police say that he was gunned down in June 2019 on the city's far west side. His white Ford Expedition ended up crashing into a vacant gas station. A witnesses tell police they saw a man driving away in a red four-door sedan. If you have any information that can help investigators, call 210-224-STOP. The Bear County Sheriff's Office has arrested two men accused of stealing a vehicle at gunpoint late last night. And right now, deputies still searching for a third suspect. BCSO made arrests just after 2.30 this morning in the 5100 block of Badland Beacon, which is in northeast Bear County, not far from Ben Zingelman. Deputies say they followed the stolen vehicle until the suspects bailed out. They tried to run away. The names of those suspects have not been released. New data out this morning giving us a better picture on the rise of COVID cases here in San Antonio. Bear County reported more than 9,000 cases in June alone. That amounts to about 74% of all cases since this pandemic began back in March. The Alamo City also had its highest monthly positive test rate in June. 13% of the tests yielded positive results. While the death toll in San Antonio remains low at a 111, health officials say the surge in cases has the potential to overwhelm our health care system. Only 27% of hospital beds were available as of yesterday, with hospitalizations hitting a new high of 1,019. For those still wanting to get tested for COVID-19, Guadalupe County is hosting a free testing site tomorrow in Seguin. It will be open from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. at Max Starkey Park. Tests are available for everyone, even those not showing symptoms. Officials strongly suggest registering before showing up, but it's not required to register. Go to texas.curativeinc.com. We also have a link with more information on our website. In your morning headlines, more than 100 people are dead in Myanmar after a landslide caused the collapse of a jade mine. Officials say the landslide was triggered by heavy rainfall. Search and rescue operations have been put on hold due to the heavy rains, but many people are believed to still be trapped. Authorities say more than 50 are hurt. The death toll is expected to rise. Landslides are common in Myanmar's gemstone mines. Some good news this morning following the release of the June jobs report. Indeed, U.S. employers added 4.8 million jobs and the unemployment rate fell to 11.1 percent. The country now has recovered roughly one third of the 22 million jobs lost in the pandemic recession. But the coronavirus cases spiking across multiple states 
uh, have experts worried the job market recovery could be stalling. Still some bright spots in the economy have come to light in recent weeks. Manufacturers expanded in June after three months of shrinking and record low mortgage rates are encouraging more home buyers. Well, all the kind of headlines like that tend to affect the market right now and it's had a positive effect right now taking a live look at the Dow Jones Industrial Average. It is up over 445 points at 26,181. A bipartisan group of lawmakers will be briefed today on intelligence that claims Russia was offering bounties for attacks on U.S. troops in Afghanistan. President Trump is calling the allegations, quote, just another hoax. I think, frankly, that many of the intelligence people didn't think it was something that even happened. U.S. officials say the Russian bounty assessment was based on eavesdropping, Taliban interrogations and financial transactions to the Taliban. According to the New York Times, a $100,000 payoff was offered for every U.S. and coalition soldier targeted. Sources telling CNN the White House had intelligence on these bounties in early 2019, but administration officials say President Trump was not told about it. A California woman is paying the price after ignoring signs at Yellowstone National Park telling people not to approach the wildlife. Officials say she got too close to a bison, ended up being charged by that animal. This was all caught on camera. Video shows the 72-year-old woman repeatedly trying to pet the bison until it starts charging at her. Witnesses oh no. say she was thrown 10 to 15 feet in the air. She was left unconscious. When she woke up, she had no memory of what happened to her. If you don't bug them, they're not going to bug you, like, yeah. it, especially when you go camping, like, that's their home and we're kind of the invaders, like, that's where they live and we need, people need to be respectful of that. The woman was airlifted to an Idaho hospital. She suffered minor injuries and we can say that she has now been released. She's lucky. Mm -hmm. uh, silly, though. I mean, what was she thinking? I don't know. She Too wasn't. Close. 909 right now, 81 degrees. Still ahead on GMSA at 9 when Texas shut down schools and went online to finish out the school year. Not everyone made that transition. A new Texas Education Agency report explains how many kids essentially disappeared from the education system amid this pandemic. Details ahead in our Tribune Thursday report. The coronavirus has put a spotlight on many issues we've had in the city even before the pandemic. And now a new episode of Case Out Explains takes a, uh, a closer look at some of these issues. RJ Marquez joins us with a preview later in this newscast. You can't see it, but we're smiling big today. And that's because classic desserts, southern desserts with a twist. Just take a look at this. We're live from Southern Roots Vegan Bakery, where we're prepping some cinnamon rolls from scratch. How to order straight to your doorstep just ahead on GMSA at 9. Welcome back. Classic Southern desserts with a healthy twist. A local black owned bakery is baking vegan treats that ship nationwide. If you're looking to indulge without leaving home, this might be the perfect reason to shop local and small. Alicia Beretta is live in San Marcos with the owners of this online vegan bakery. Good morning, Alicia. Good morning, you guys. I am wearing the mask, but I can still smell the deliciousness of this cinnamon roll here that Mr. Marcus Pitts has been preparing for us today. So out online, we can find different vegan treats just like this one. Absolutely. Uh, we have donuts, cakes, uh, brownies, cinnamon rolls, and uh, cookies, sugar and chocolate chip. And then today we're making the cinnamon roll, and you mentioned that it is quite a process. So right now you're, you're cutting it up to get it ready to put in the pan. Yes, yeah, so the cinnamon rolls, uh, we actually let them rise for a while. And once we cut them up and chop them up, they need to rise for another 30 minutes then before they bake for 30 minutes. So it is a little bit of a process, but they are delicious. And just so y'all get the idea behind Southern Roots Vegan Bakery, they actually launched in September of 2019. But let me tell you, in this past month, their sales, they tell me, have um, gone up by 100%. So what do you think that's due to, Marcus? So we were uh, featured in a magazine, an online magazine, and that got us so much exposure. And after that, like again, our sales, they just increased a uh, hundredfold. And, and we've been uh, just catching up ever since, trying to fill these orders and going as fast as we can. But it's been super supportful and, uh, we, and we've gotten a lot of, a yeah. lot of uh, orders. 
orders. Wonderful. Well, the way to order is only online. They don't have a storefront, so these will ship straight to your doorstep. The news at noon, that's where we'll have the full story on how exactly to go about this order and continue supporting black-owned businesses. Reporting live, Alicia Barrera, KSAT 12 News. Oh, looking tasty, isn't it? Mm-hmm. Mm, thanks, like Alicia. Said, even with the mask. That's right. <laughs> if you can't catch the noon, the uh, website southernrootsvegan.com looks like they run about $25 for an assorted dozen. But they've got a couple other, they've got cookies and all sorts of stuff on here. So twenty twenty five bucks. Lunch first. Mm-hmm. Lunch first. Yeah. <laughs> and then the dessert. dessert. <laughs> <laughs> all right, Justin, how are things shaping up out there? Uh, looking pretty good today. It's it's hot. It's humid. We know that. We're going to have a little bit of dust to contend with, too. We, we did get some rain overnight in spots here across South Texas. Take a look at the radar. This is over the last six hours. And you'll see that we had some storms out around Del Rio, Valverde County. There were actually a few sprinkles a little bit earlier in San Antonio, too. But the bulk of the rain uh, was out here around Del Rio. And the, the numbers were pretty impressive as far as rainfall goes. This is mainly west of Del Rio. So uh, in the city, you didn't see all that much, but estimates of about four to five inches, maybe even a little bit higher than that out west. And uh, that, that may cause a little bit of flooding there right along the river. But all in all, uh, good to see at least a, a little bit of rain on the radar, right? Uh, because we we're going to move into a pretty dry period. And, and we're still looking at drought conditions for a large portion of our viewing area. You see sort of the brown color there. That's the moderate area of drought. And this is the new drought monitor, by the way, which just came in. And we still have a little area there uh, where we're seeing a severe drought around Carrizo Springs. San Antonio is still in good shape, but we may start to see this creep in a little bit more if the forecast continues as is. We do have some rain chances coming up, but they're not great. Uh, let's check in on Medina Lake, too. It continues to fall. 64% full. It's uh, down about 17 feet. Down 7 feet since 6 months ago. So it still continues to trend downward. A little bit of rain would be good, but we're not going to get it today. 81 degrees, mostly cloudy. Dew point is at 73. That number has been so high for the last couple days. It will come down some this afternoon. I think we're going to see a little bit less new wave, huge heat indices this afternoon. But right now it feels like 86. And we do have a southerly breeze out there. You see some of the morning clouds. We've also got some uh, leftover clouds from those storms out west. So it's going to start off mostly cloudy today. but. We're already starting to see some breaks here around San Antonio. So the earlier we get sun, the warmer those temperatures will be in the afternoon. And we're well on our way. 82 right now. Randolph, 85. New Braunfels, 79 in Comfort. And uh, 82 right now in Kennedy. Most places will jump up uh, into the 90s this afternoon. And right now, we have a heat index, even at this hour. So this is what it feels like. 90 in Creso Springs, 90 in Pleasanton. Already pretty bad out there, but I promise that dew point will come down some. Right now, the computer models bring the dew points down in the low 60s, so maybe just within the muggy territory, but a little bit better than those 70s that we've been dealing with. And so the heat index yesterday was 104. We're thinking 100, 101 this afternoon. So just a couple degrees better. Not much, but a little. Uh, 104, the predicted heat index out there near Del Rio. Future cast shows that high pressure will start to shift west a little bit, and that may open the door Monday into Tuesday. Looks like we could get some isolated showers and maybe a couple storms back in the forecast, which is great news. And uh, very quickly, let's look at the dust forecast here because I know that's uh, a big impact on some of us who are allergic to that. This isn't a huge plume, but you're going to see a little bit of haze today. I think today and tomorrow, maybe even into Saturday before this dissipates a little bit and uh, we'll get rid of the dust. But that's a couple of plumes back to back there that we've had to deal with. 98 degrees today, heat index anywhere from 98 to 101 this afternoon. And we'll go 98 tomorrow, 99 Saturday, 100 Sunday, and then some rain chances Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. Guys, thank you. All right, thanks, Justin. 919, 81 degrees. Still ahead on GMSA at nine, it's being called the COVID slide, and it describes the hundreds of thousands of Texas school children left behind when classes went online amid the pandemic. That's next in our Tribune Thursday report. Well, amid a statewide surge in COVID-19 cases, contact tracing efforts have decreased. And a new report shares how many kids were left behind when Texas schools shifted to online classes. Alana Rocha from the Texas Tribune has those stories and more. She joins us from her home in Austin. Good morning, Alana.
Good morning. So Texas reported more than 8,000 new cases of coronavirus Wednesday, more than doubling new case counts from two weeks ago. The state also reporting more than 6,900 patients in Texas hospitalized with coronavirus. Record-breaking numbers. No doubt Texas is a hot spot right now. So how are officials responding to this drastic uptick in cases? It's mixed messaging. Uh, you know, you have uh, the governor going on local stations talking about how the spread is rampant, but not really uh, conveying clear uh, messaging as to exactly what should be done about it. Um, you know, you have city county leaders asking the governor if they can impose local stay at home orders, if they can require everyone to wear masks, not just businesses to require that employees and customers wear masks. Um, you know, they're trying to rein in these numbers, given what we're seeing at hospital capacity in Houston and other areas, um, and, and just not hearing a, a, a centralized, a cohesive message is exactly what to do and who uh, Texans should be listen to, listening to to uh, get that message. As coronavirus cases surged, Texas's contact tracing workforce actually shrunk. Why is that? Uh, hundreds of healthcare workers that were temporarily reassigned to do contact tracing have since been put back on their regular duties. Uh, and they're 1,200 uh, short of the governor's goal of 4,000. So there's 2,800 contact tracers currently. Uh, Health Department says they have the ability to surge that number uh, at a moment's notice. And you would think that they would be doing that given uh, that yesterday alone they had 8,000 new cases, uh, you know, 2,800 people to trace those, uh, you know, positive uh, Texans steps and contact anybody they had contact with um, for possible exposure, advise them to uh, isolate, to again, rein in the, the spread of this. It's just woefully short. Add to the fact that it's hours to get testing for many people. It's weeks to get those results. That's just more possible exposure they've had unknowingly and more work for the contact tracers. A lot of education has been a big concern throughout all of this. A new report out from the Texas Education Agency shows that more than 600,000 students or one in 10 did not complete assignments or respond to teacher outreach during this pandemic. Education Commissioner Mike Morath has stressed that schools should be prepared this fall to address the effects of what he's calling the COVID slide. Explain that. Yeah, it's the academic backslide that many students um, suffered as a result of of learning remotely, either they didn't have access to internet, older kids potentially got jobs to help supplement the family's income who, you know, maybe lost uh, out during that economic, uh, you know, shutdown. Essentially, younger kids uh, were really not able to be reached, many, uh, not all, but, you know, vulnerable populations took the hardest hit, those in the low income uh, category, blacks, Hispanic uh, children, as well compared to their white and Asian higher income counterparts. So, uh, you know, this all comes down to funding too, because districts get money based on the number of students and seats. The education commissioner says, as long as those districts can prove that they're educating virtually, they can keep their funding levels the same, but 600,000, that's a, uh, you know, a lot of empty seats, if you will, and that, uh, you know, schools will be working to try and reach those students ahead of fall. Let's talk about what's new on the trip. You guys have some new stories about daycares and early voting. Early voting, daycares, uh, yeah, I mean, cases are surging at daycares. Early voting, of course, is underway here for the July runoff that was delayed due to the pandemic uh, from May. And there's also a story about vanilla ice. So I'll leave that teaser there to, for people to check out. It's related to coronavirus, uh, you know, potential concert he's having uh, later this week. All right, now we got to go to the website. Now we do. <laughs> Alana Rocha from the <laughs> Texas Tribune, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you. Still ahead on GMSA at 9, 97 days. That's how long a Wisconsin man was hospitalized battling COVID-19. His message to others now that he's out of the hospital. The pandemic has left assisted living facility residents especially isolated as visitor access is shut down. But a facility in North Carolina has come up with a creative way to ease the strain of social isolation, how you can participate in their pen pal program. New episode of Case That Explains is now available to stream. It focuses on the impact the pandemic has had on our city. RJ Mar Marquez is here to break it all down coming up next. Welcome back 931 on your Thursday morning. The coronavirus has highlighted issues that San Antonio already had before this pandemic began. This week's episode of Case That Explains focuses on the uneven impact the pandemic has had here in the Alamo City. And RJ Marquez joins us live 
in the newsroom. RJ, it's good to see you under the same rooftop with us. Uh, what can we expect from this new episode? Yeah, guys, glad to be with you this morning. And uh, for this episode of Case That Explains, we really kind of wanted to dig into the numbers. And when you think about it, we see the numbers every day. We're getting a spike now in COVID-19 cases here in Bear County, across the state. But what does that really mean? And who is this really affecting? And that's kind of what we wanted to sort of dive into and really see what communities are being the most affected and how this is affecting um, you know, people that have lost their jobs, health insurance, uh, access to health care, education. So we're covering all sorts of angles when it comes to this latest episode. You and I have worked on this project. The episode is out now. How have the city's demographics played a part in these issues that we're seeing highlighted now? Yeah, um, Myra, you know, I think as we were doing the work here for this uh, for this latest episode, I think we saw a couple of really kind of staggering things when it comes to the stats. And I always kind of think of it as the numbers don't lie, right? I mean, we are really in trouble when it comes to uh, median household income. It's about $51,000. That's 50% of households actually earn less than that. And the one shocking thing is San Antonio has the highest poverty rate in the country out of the United States when it comes to the big metro areas. Detroit is second. And I remember interviewing some people for uh, this episode and they were saying that, you know, you think of Detroit and then you think of San Antonio and, and really you don't kind of think of the fact that we are above them when it comes to our poverty rate. So that's a major issue. 18.6% of our community lives under the poverty line and even uh, a lot live right above it. So this is definitely um, a major issue. Yeah, you don't typically put those cities side by side. Mm -hmm. uh, you know what, uh, there's been a lot of lines at testing clinics around the metro area, uh, RJ. What mm -hmm. did you learn about access to health care? Yeah, that's been a big issue. And we've seen the wait times uh, to get tested. Uh, former uh, our former health director, Don Emmerich, said, uh, was asked during one of the briefings, you know, is that an issue here? And she said, of course, I mean, you see these wait times, it is definitely an issue. We are uh, a city that has a large amount of uninsured rates in the country. I mean, people are, um, people are losing their jobs, people that uh, were working in hospitality, restaurant, tourism, you know, when they lost their jobs, they also lost a lot of that health coverage. So that's a key issue that we kind of dug into. And of course, talking to local leaders that uh, really kind of wanted to focus on health and wellness as we move forward. We talked a little bit earlier in the show about access to online learning. Of course, there was the big shift during this pandemic from the classrooms. The digital divide has played a big role here. The gap between people who have access to the Internet and those right. who do not. So how has that affected students in local schools? Yeah, that's been huge. And, you know, I give credit to our teachers, administrators that really kind of had to pick up things on the fly. I mean, they really had to put together plans. Uh, we talk about in mid-March, not I would say none of us really expected that no one would be back in physically in classrooms. So this has been a key issue. Uh, we kind of found some interesting numbers here that uh, we got from SA 2020. Uh, districts 1, 2, 4, and 5 had the lowest rates of connectivity in the city. I mean, it's pretty amazing. Um, the southwest side, the east side, and the southeast side are really hurt by the access to the internet. And it's not only hurting schools. I mean, people that are trying to work from home, uh, people that maybe don't have access to the internet, and they have to go physically into their jobs. This is also kind of, um, you know, leading to the spread of what we're seeing right now in the transmission across the city. There was a lot at play in this episode. It's actually going to be broken into two parts. So this is the very right. first part coming up tonight. RJ, thanks so much uh, for explaining all of this. And of course, this new episode of Case That Explains is out now. You can watch it any way that you stream. If you've got Amazon Fire TV, Roku, any of those you see there, or go to our website. You can watch the whole thing on ksat.com. Can't wait to check it out. Let's yep. go outside. Thanks RJ, lot, thank you again. Thank you so much. Let's go outside with live cam. Back to Justin Horn, and uh, we were talking to Mike about this on the early, early show. We kind of settled into the summer doldrums weather-wise. We have. The, the weather pattern's getting a little boring. There may be some changes as we get into next week, hopefully with some rain chances. But for right now, it's quiet, it's hot, it's humid, and it's a little hazy, too. Let's take a look at the temperatures. 81 degrees at the airport, 82 Holotus. What we've done here is put the visible satellite picture on top of the temperatures. And one thing you'll notice is the clouds are already starting to clear out, unlike yesterday where they lasted quite a bit longer. So this means we should see some at least slightly higher temperatures this afternoon. Here's a look at the pollen count. Dust is on the increase. We're seeing low counts of mold, pigweed, and grass, though. So the one thing we're going to watch today is the dust.
and we do have one plume starting to move in. Again, not as bad as the last one, but you will see some haze in the atmosphere today. Other thing we got to pass along, CPS Energy uh, calling for a peak usage day, so they're asking for you to lower your energy use 3 p.m. to 6 p.m. because temperatures are really going to ramp up today, and uh, we're also going to see those heat index values up around 101 here in San Antonio. Uh, 104 Del Rio, 100 New Valley, 104 Carrizo Springs. Uh, some big time numbers again today and we'll probably keep that going into the weekend. There's a look at the forecast. 98, the high temperature, partly cloudy. Southerly winds 10 to 15 miles per hour and hazy. Guys? All right, thanks, Justin. Let's take a look at Transguide right now. 410 at Bandera, all smooth sailing in this view. And, uh, same thing here at 410 and Callahan. No big problems to tell you about on the roads. Is it me or does the traffic seem lighter? Maybe because of the pandemic and the spike or Maybe heading into the holidays? Probably a combination of all those things. Hey, some feel good stories this morning. A new COVID-19 survivor in Wisconsin is finally home after spending 97 days in the hospital. Wow, Rick Klimek was given a standing ovation as he left Aurora St. Luke's Hospital Tuesday. The 65 year old says he was in good health and has no idea how he got the virus. Klimek says he was reluctant to go to the hospital because he thought he just had the flu. He ended up spending several weeks in a medically induced coma. Klimek now encouraging everyone to wear masks and practice social distancing so they don't have to experience what he just went through. An assisted living facility in North Carolina has come up with a creative way to ease the strain of social isolation for its residents. Took just one question for the facility's Facebook post to go viral. Will you be my pen pal? Residents smiled for pictures while holding signs with their names and their interests. Staff then shared the images on Facebook with the address of where to send those letters. The response was massive. Mail and packages poured in from across the globe, including Germany, New Zealand, and countries in Africa. If you want to participate, just look up Victorian Senior Care on Facebook. Well, we've done study, stories on this before. Uh, they've done studies. I think one of the most remarkable ones was at Princeton University, where they proved uh, they found the actual dollar amount that proves money can buy happiness. It kind of makes me a little sad <laughs> to hear this, but the Washington Post has put out an article saying that uh, the expanding class divide in happiness in the U.S. This project from 1972 to 2016, it's found that people age 30 and older, the correlation between income and happiness among that group has steadily risen over the years. That's right. Uh, they've got the new survey, 44,000 participants found a growing class divide in happiness with the happiness of whites with no college education steadily declining since 1972, while the happiness of whites with college education stayed steady. Meantime, in the African-American community, happiness levels there of people with no college education has stayed steady since 72. The happiness of black people with a college education has increased. For both races, though, this study says the happiness gap by education has grown. Mm -hmm. And I can't remember what the, the number was that Princeton found, but they found typically sometimes, uh, not necessarily does a rise in income always correlate to a rise in the happiness quotient. Yes, let's not put a number on happiness. No, no let's not. Let's, let's just let's... keep going. <laughs> right now we're at 939, 81 degrees. You're watching GMSA at 9. All right, it's almost here. A filmed 2016 performance of the Broadway hit Hamilton is coming to Disney Plus tomorrow. A preview after the break. The pandemic may have shut down Broadway for the rest of the year, but one of its most popular shows can soon be enjoyed from the comfort of your own home. CNN's Douglas Hyde gives us a look at Hamilton, which will be available on Disney Plus tomorrow. My name is Alexander Hamilton. And there's a million things I haven't done. Hamilton was an instant sensation when it opened on Broadway five years ago. Lin-Manuel Miranda's musical on the life of founding father Alexander Hamilton was a sold-out smash and won just about every award it was up for, including multiple Tonys and the Pulitzer Prize for Best Drama. The ten founded father without a father got a filmed 2016 Broadway performance with Miranda and the original cast debuts on Disney Plus this week. The action was shot from six different camera positions, Plus, some energetic editing gives the hip-hop-flavored production a fresh, cinematic feel. A toast to the groom. To the groom. To the groom. To the groom. The film combines the performances taped in front of the audience with separately shot close-ups and camera angles that put the viewer on the stage, giving them literally the best seat in the house. To 
Virginians and an immigrant walk into a room diametrically opposed. Miranda and company had to scrub out a few four-letter words to make it more family-friendly for Disney. But otherwise, Hamilton's music and message still packs its original punch. All right, all right, that's what I'm talking about! In Hollywood, I'm Douglas Hyde. And I'm going to go ahead and tell you right now, for those that have not yet had a chance to see Hamilton in any form or fashion, King George of England is the scene stealer, so look out for him. Okay, okay? I'm for sure going to watch it. I yeah. have wanted to see it. I want to know what it's all about. Right. We've yeah. been talking about it for a while now. Oh. Justin, you, you said you hadn't caught it yet either. No, I haven't seen it, but I would imagine the numbers, it's it's on Disney Plus, right, where it's going to stream. I would right. imagine the yes. numbers are going to be huge. That's yeah. what we were talking about. When something debuts on Disney Plus, I'm going to give it a, a week or so, so I don't get that buffer. Right. You know? <laughs> yeah. Everyone's trying to do it at once. No one likes the yeah. buffer. No. No one, no one wants mm -mm. to buffer. <laughs> No fun. We want uh, the internet, neither, but no buffering. No buffering. We don't like that. Yeah, this, <laughs> this heat isn't great either. I mean, the, the numbers yesterday were incredible, but we're going to see that again today. 98 degrees here in San Antonio. You see the heat indices up there around Dallas, Waco, up to 110 potentially in a few spots. That's where heat advisories are posted again today. But I will tell you, these numbers are a little lower than yesterday, so there is that. And the reason is because we're going to see slightly lower dew points today. So as we get into the afternoon, the air is going to dry out just a little bit. And that will help us keep those heat index values from just getting out of control. But hot is hot, right? It's still going to be hot this afternoon. We had a couple of showers and storms a little bit earlier this morning out in Valverde County. Actually, these storms lasted most of the night. Uh, they've just now died down. Still some activity out there in Mexico. Uh, but we did get some pretty good rainfall totals out there in Valverde County. Some estimates of four to five inches in some cases. Uh, west of Del Rio. Now in Del Rio, you only picked up about a tenth of an inch, so it wasn't that that much, but the, just west of town along the river, uh, some pretty big numbers. And there was some rain that fell up north of Rock Springs around Junction. We saw a couple sprinkles here in San Antonio, but nothing that would amount to anything. Uh, and the aquifer needs the rain. We're still seeing it uh, really in a decline here. We're at uh, 660.4 last check this morning, and we've drawn the line there. Uh, 660, that's the important number because once we fall below that number for a 10-day rolling average, then we're starting to talk about restrictions. Uh, looks like we could be moving in that direction if the forecast stays as it is. And right now, it looks like it's going to be fairly dry. Uh, there are some chances going into next week, but not great rain chances. Outside right now, it does look a little hazy. We're starting to get some more of that dust starting to move in. 81 degrees, mostly cloudy at the airport. Dew point is at 73, and southerly winds at 15. So that dew point's still up for now with uh, heat index at 86. Satellite picture shows we do have some morning clouds a little bit there in Bear County. A lot of places seeing the sun, but we're starting to see a little bit more build in briefly. I think we'll see partly cloudy skies this afternoon. Clouds will probably go away a little bit quicker today than they did yesterday. 85 in New Braunfels, 83 right now. Hondo, 84 Carrizo Springs. There's still quite a bit of cloud cover out west, so temperatures are a little cooler until Rio this morning. 79 degrees there. And uh, we showed you that uh, we've got 80s here across Bear County for the most part. That dew point does drop off this afternoon. So we're talking maybe some upper 50s and this is updated. So that would feel a little, little bit better and uh, that will keep that heat index from jumping up above 100. Hopefully looking forward, the ridge fire pressure that's over us does start to shift off a little bit to the west. Still hot through the weekend. In fact, we could see some triple digits, but what this does do is open the door Monday to Tuesday for some showers and storms. Right now, I think Tuesday is probably our best chance. And even then we're talking about a 30% shot, but at least it's something. And uh, at least that ridge five pressure is right over top of us. 98 today, hazy conditions, heat index as high as 101. Uh, 98 Friday, 99 Saturday, 100 Sunday, probably our hottest day. And then rain chances kick in Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. Right now, a 30% chance of rain on Tuesday. We'll be right back. 1,019, that's how many people are currently hospitalized with COVID-19 here in Bear County. County officials now closing down parks ahead of the July 4th holiday weekend. Here's today's 9 at 9. Bear County saw hundreds of COVID-19 cases added in the latest report yesterday for now a new total of 12,504. And for the first time, the number of people in the hospital has crossed the 1,000 mark. I know some of us think that we're invincible, 
But this disease reminds us that we're not. In just the last four months, more Americans have died from COVID-19 than all U.S. soldiers killed in the 18 months the U.S. was involved in World War I, plus the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. The city and county closing parks in hopes of bringing down the surge in coronavirus cases here at home. We know the good part of what we did back in Easter when we closed. Nothing closed on Memorial Day, so we want to take the extra precaution of closing the parks on the July the 4th. New hope in the urgent race for a coronavirus vaccine. Pfizer today announcing promising results from early trials. The World Health Organization's latest report shows 17 potential vaccines in human trials, 132 in preclinical phases. Rescue workers say the death toll after a landslide in Myanmar continues to increase. The incident took place at a jade mine in the northern part of the country. The heartbroken family of Fort Hood soldier Vanessa Guillen demanding justice for the 20-year-old who's been missing since April, criticizing the Army for taking too long to act on her disappearance. She signed that contract with the Army to protect and serve the country, yet look how they treated her, like if it was she, she was nothing. Today, a bipartisan group of lawmakers will be briefed on intelligence that alleges Moscow was offering bounties for attacks on U.S. troops based in Afghanistan. A source from CNN says the White House had intelligence on these bounties back in early 2019, but Trump administration officials say the president was not told about it. Officers in riot gear swarming Seattle's Occupy protest zone, reclaiming their precinct in the area that saw crime skyrocket by more than 500 percent and two teens fatally shot. Our job is to support peaceful demonstrations, but what has happened here on these streets is lawless and it's brutal, and bottom line, it is simply unacceptable. Alexa and Siri may be triggered more often than you think. Researchers have pinpointed a thousand word sequences that can bring them to life. Experts say false triggers could lead to privacy intrusions. It is Throwback Thursday on the News at Noon today. We're throwing all the way back to the 1930s. David Sears takes a look at Alamo Fireworks' humble beginnings. Now the oldest independent fireworks company in the state of Texas. That's today on the News at Noon. And we're already up to 85 degrees. Uh, we should make it up into the upper 90s today. It'll feel a little bit warmer than that. Thankfully, the humidity is down a little bit. But of course, the other thing we have to contend with is the haze in the atmosphere, some of that dust moving back in. And it promises to be a hot weekend as well. No surprise that the same week we find out Whataburger, beloved Whataburger here in San Antonio, is expanding to Kansas City and Tennessee. They've also unveiled a new look. That's right. Whataburger reimagining its restaurant design that said is updated design with refreshed interiors. This is going to start in Waco or just outside of Waco, the very first one. But if you're thinking like I was, what about the A-frame? Where is that going to go? They're saying they're going to try to incorporate that somehow. Yeah, it's kind of there on the edge of the of the structure. Uh, their senior vice president uh, for real estate said there's a lot of things people hold sacred about our brand. It's the iconic A-frame, the visuals, our branding, the linkage to our past. So we really tried to blend those concepts into this new prototype. And that new prototype, uh, its first location, I believe, is the Zarzamora Street location is what it says it's going to that's going to be the uh, one of the first remodels. Remodels, uh, yep. yes. And they say Whataburger's service model is more like a diner. The store refresh comes after the change studied its equipment, drive through capacities, and flows to understand where its challenges were to become more efficient. Look for the remodels in about six months. There you go. Have a great morning, everybody. Thanks so much for watching. See you next time.